Among those who were favored by Allah, we were discussing the highest strength that is Prophet. And by trying to understand the nature of Prophethood, we were trying to understand the nature of favors of Allah, why Allah favors some, and what is the nature of those favors, and uh, how one can achieve those blessings. Apart from other, apart from those particular blessings of Allah in the form of prophethood, which we discussed last time, I have chosen a few more to demonstrate to you from various verses of the Holy Quran. The institution of prophethood is a vast institution. It serves certain specific purposes which can also be served to a lesser degree by other institutions, but not as well as by prophets themselves. They stand at the highest rank of those who demonstrate those excellent qualities. And uh, as a whole, they are paragon of virtue. In their time, none other than the Prophet himself <coughs> excels in all these qualities and all human beings, whatever rank they hold with Allah, stand in a lesser position as compared to the Prophet. So this is why the Holy Quran specifies this role played by the Prophets in the verse لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رُسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمُ الْآخِرَةِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Verily you have in the Prophet of Allah an excellent model for him who fears Allah in the last day and who remembers Allah much. Now this is a common feature of every prophet. Before Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were other prophets who in their time were modeled before their own people. Like Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam has also been referred to as a model in the Holy Quran in the verse, but kanat lakum uswatun hasanatun fi Ibrahima. There is a good model for you in Abraham and those with him and so on. So the prophets not only present a paragon of virtue, a model for the rest to follow, but they also create models. They are the first model created by Allah. Then they mold other models to set examples for the rest of the world. 
Now, once these models are created, as has been referred to in the other verse which I read, not only in Abraham was a, a, was a model created for men, but also in those who followed him, who were with him, Wallazina Mahu, they were they also became models. So in the Holy Quran we we read mention of Ahadu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his caliphs and his followers and companions to have become ultimately all models for the rest of the mankind. Now these models once created gradually to a passage of time lose some of the qualities of excellence. Not the first generation itself, but those who follow them later on, they begin to lose those qualities. And the models which are created from models are lesser so in quality and excellence. And so other models and other models which are created in, in generation in chains, they ultimately lose the quality to a degree that they are no longer worthy of being called models. So this is why Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa وسلم, himself declared the generations like bearing generations to be the, his own generation, then the generation which would follow that generation, then the generation that would follow the second generation, and after that, no light would, would be left, except for the stray light from heaven, which Allah would, would uh, show for the benefit of mankind, like, like uh, stars appear in the absence of sun. So, after the dusk is finished, after there is no remnant, remnant of direct sunlight, then of course the stars appear later on, but uh, the stars appear when the night has set, set in. But those stars are not directly lighted by the sun. Similarly, those are not the models created directly by the models created by the prophets. They appear later on and a different phenomena takes over. But anyway, this is one of the most important functions that a prophet performs. A revelation is made to him. He understands what Allah wants people to do and how Allah wants them to behave and conduct themselves. So, he has the first right and the first ability to present the model and as I have declared, gradually this uh, process fades out and ultimately no models are left which are worthy of being called models. When this happens, would a prophet be required or not? If not, how would he be substituted as such in the absence of models to whom would people look up to for guidance, for a living guidance in, in the form of a living message. As far as we understand previously before the time of the Holy Prophet of Islam, this function was always carried out by prophets. But at the time of Wasallam, a prophecy was made that this function would be carried out by an institution called the Mujaddidiyya, that is, those who revive the faith, those people who will be called Mujaddidin, who would revive the faith for the mankind, for the Muslims, and who would appear at the turn of every century. Now, they would sort of substitute the lack of that model and fill the blank. But still, because they are not declared as prophets, 
they can't be considered at par with the prophets and uh, they can't fully substitute the office. There would something be always lacking. It is impossible not to miss a prophet. Uh, in, despite the fact that you are passing through the age of a mujaddid, both cannot be bracketed along in quality, in excellence, in the degree of effectiveness and everything. So, the result, what result should one expect? That despite the institution of Mujaddidiyya, there should be a gradual loss of light and color. And every other century should find itself at a low step in quality and excellence. And although the process would be, would be arrested, the process of downfall would be arrested by the coming of Mujahideens to a reasonable degree, but not entirely. The result would be that there would be a gradual deepening of darkness. And this is exactly what we perceive in the history of Islam as it actually happened. Mujahideen came and gave a new boost to moral, cultural, spiritual values of Islam and uh, presented themselves as sorts of models, but they had not directly benefited from living models. What they had done was, they had studied the models in history, they had perceived them in the backlight of uh, um, traditions and so on, and they tried to act like them. But still, they were not the creation of a direct contact with models. So, they filled the blank to a very great degree indeed, no doubt about it. But uh, you still feel the lack of something better, something more superior. And as I have mentioned, this can be demonstrated by the study of Islamic history that we find that every other century, despite the coming of various Mujahideen, sometimes more than one in one century, overall trend of the Muslim people was downward. They went on splitting into various sects. They went on, went on differing with each other with more vehemence. They went on increasing their differences to a degree that ultimately they differed in fundamentals, not only in, uh, in you know, superficial things, but the fundamental values of Islam. And overall, overall moral, cultural, social standards and the standard of knowledge, academic standards and so on, everything went on deteriorating gradually. Critically also they deteriorated. And no number of Mujahideen could uh, take them back to the original platform of excellence where Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa had left his companion in his progress. So obviously the need of profit remains. Somebody who could be directly the recipient of Allah's life and his blessing and who would be created by Allah's hand directly as more in the fashion of Muhammad So that is one function of prophethood which is uh, a blessing personified and which once the once we, we, we lose, once we miss no one else, no other institution can uh, completely replace. Now we are all aware of the institution of prayer, particularly Ahmadis are so well aware of the importance of prayer <coughs> that uh, nowhere else will you find any community in the world which is so oriented in the direction of prayer, prayer, which is so well prayer-minded. And with these, go on, 
reminding each other for prayer, day in and day out. Whenever they meet their friends, whenever they write to their relatives or friends or people whom they are holding some reverence, they keep on requesting them for prayer. While this phenomenon is not occurring elsewhere in the world, it is lacking in other communities. It is very rarely nowadays that you see other Muslim sects doing the same thing. In their ordinary correspondence in every everyday meeting, you never find people requesting each other for prayer as much as and as strongly as Hindus do, with such great emphasis, and considering it to be a reality of life. <laughs> and they pray regularly, and they attach so much importance to the prayer. In ordinary life, in everything, even the small children, soon going children, they pay so much importance to prayer that uh, they go and uh, take the examination and uh, during the examination they pray when they return home, they write uh, to their, their elders for prayers and uh, if, even before the examination is approached, you know, they are always obsessed with the necessity of prayer and uh, they know this, this is going to do something, you know, about them. Some extra requirement will be fulfilled, which they lack by the prayer. So prayer is a very important institution in the life of believers. And of all those whose prayers is accepted, prophets stand among uh, stand on the highest platform. No other man can compete with prophets in the acceptance of death. This is why the companions of the Holy Prophet vied with each other for seeking the Prophet's prayers for themselves. And they prayed him to him and they begged him for prayers and reminded him of prayers day and night, although he himself was always praying for them on his own. So the institution of prayer, as we studied during the time of the Holy Prophet of Islam, is in a way revived in our time through Ahmadiyya Tidhiya Sabala. But this has a very special quality when uh, this prayer acquires a very special quality when prophets pray to God. And the Holy Quran recognizes this and reminds us of this. Addressing the Holy Prophet of Islam, Allah tells him, Khud me mawalehim sadaqat, to tahiruhum, wa to zakkihim beha, wa salli alayhim, inna salataka sakanul lahum, wallahu samiyun alim. This word salli alayhim is used in the Holy Quran both with the connotation of praying for the dead as well as for in the connotation of praying for the life. Here it is used in connotation in this connotation of praying for the life. It means take arms out of their well so that thou mayst cleanse them and purify them thereby and pray for them. The prayer, thy prayer is indeed a source of tranquility for them. So although the, the companions of the Holy Prophet also prayed for each other and there were great holy men and great uh, people like Siddhi, Shawda and Salihin among them, but nothing like the prayer of Prophet who could be, uh, I mean, could be witnessed to them, it was cherished most highly and sought most highly. So when the Prophets pass away, Though the institution remains behind, but that special quality of prayer is missing after it. And that is also a special blessing of Allah which is uh, particularly uh, prominent in the office of in the institution of prophethood. So when Amru sallallahu alayhi wa was called back by Allah, 
the people did miss that prayer. No, it, they felt it. There was something which they could never reach again. And the same was the feeling of the companions of Hazrat Masim or the Rasulat was Salaam and we do it, do it, do it from, uh, you know, directly from them. If you read one poem written by Hazrat Musim after the birth of Hazrat Musim of the Salaam, on this subject then you will know how passionately and uh, how deeply the companions of the Prophet Musayab missed his prayers. Muslim Maud himself, whose prayers were also heard very specially by Allah, he is yearning for the prayer of Hazrat Musim of the And the poem is so pathetic, so deeply charged with that sense of missing something, that sense of why, after the passing of the Hazrat Musim of the so that is also a very special blessing of Allah attached with the institution of prophethood. It is not just to tell people how to go about and frame their, their ways of life and so on. It is not just a law bringing institution. It has many added benefits, many fringe benefits as well and fundamental benefits other than the regulation of law. Then again, we read in the Holy Quran that the Prophets of Allah are Hakam. Hakam means one who is capable of deriving, deriving correct conclusions from the book revealed to, 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 to Prophets or the books revealed to Prophets. And in this verse which I have chosen, Adr is mentioned to be a hakam. فَإِن تَوَلَّهُ فَعَلَمَنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ وَأَنْ يُصِيبَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ ذُنُوبِهِمْ وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ لَفَاسِقُونَ The meaning of this verse is And we have revealed the book to thee bidding thee to judge between them by that which Allah has revealed أَنَيْكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِمَا أَنْزَلَ اللَّهُ means not only to judge, but to derive the inner, inner meaning, to understand the meaning of the book and let the others know. It is connected with the word hikmah, of course. Once, why it is called yakum uh, or hikam uh, or um, why is the prophet declared to be hakam? Because the influences which he draws from the scriptures become final and binding upon the book. While the influences which are drawn by other scholarly people from the same scriptures and books do not become binding upon others. And there still remains room for differences of opinion. So this is why when the prophets infer from the books, they are declared as Hakam. That their verdict is going to be the final. After they have passed their judgment and their verdict, they have no opportunity. La fair, as the Holy Quran mentions it, there is no fair, no choice left for the people but to follow that inference which has been drawn by the prophets themselves. Now this is also a very highly favored blessing of Allah and a very special blessing of Allah attached to the institution of prophet. No one else can provide that with that certainty as uh, provide this, uh, 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 provides us with the interpretation of the books and the scriptures with that certainty as the prophet did. So when we read uh, Fiqh, 
that is Islamic jurisprudence and the philosophy of Islamic jurisprudence in particular, you read in the introductory remarks the necessity of going into fiqh. And there you always come across this um, statement of the scholars that the need for fiqh arose merely because of the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. As long as he lived, there was no need to go into any jurisprudence debate or any difference of opinion on that head. Because whoever inferred something from the Holy Quran, so that some, uh, and, and, and was challenged by someone else who differed in that opinion, it was open for both of them to go to the Holy Prophet and reach him and ask for his verdict. And the moment they presented their case, respective cases to the Holy Prophet, he told them what actually was meant by Allah. And once the verdict was passed, the matter ended there. So the Islam remained one unified Islam in concept, in theory, in doctrine. But when Azrael the Holy Prophet of Islam, was called back by Allah, then there was no such person left to whom people could go and take his verdict to be the final. Of course, the institution of caliphate was there for a few years, but even there, the caliphate, the caliphs, except for certain uh, categories of decisions, did not claim that they were infallible in their influences of the Holy Quran. And they permitted other companions of the Holy Prophet to differ with them. And the differences of opinion began to appear, began to take shape right in the time of the Caliphate. With one difference, that if it was, if a verdict was given by a Caliph, based of course on the scriptures, that verdict was followed in practice. Nobody dared to oppose it and to rebel against it and to defy that verdict. Although they were permitted to hold their own private opinions, they would not agree maybe, in philosophy in, with entirety with the influence drawn by a canon. But they were not left with a choice to hold different uh, to, to, to act differently, to act according to their own opinion. The verdict of, of caliphs was carried out in practice in the world of Islam. Although opinions may, may differ and people were given the right to differ in opinions. So, of this, so many incidents can be quoted in the lifetime of various caliphs where people understood the Holy Quran differently and they thought that they were right, differently from, from the caliphs. In most cases, of course, they would give in after hearing the word of the caliphs. But in some cases, cases, they would not and they would stick to their own to, to influences. But in Atat, in obedience to the caliphs, they are actually. But at the lifetime, in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet of Islam, there was no such division of holding different opinion and practicing differently. They would agree entirely with the Holy Prophet in theory as well as in practice. So that was inscrutable unity of Islam that we witness at the time of Allah Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu This is the greatest blessing of a Prophet being a Hakam. After Allah Sallallahu and another, there is another institution attached and closely related to this institution of being Hakam, that is Adal. Sometimes people erroneously believe that they are one and the same thing two ways of declaring the same quality of a prophet, Hakam and other. They sit on the judgment 
seat of judgment. By Hakam they understand that they sit on the seat of judgment. And by other they understand that they dispense with justice. It is not so. Hakam in the Holy Quran is always used in the sense of interpretation of scriptures, in relation to the interpretation of scriptures. And other is just dispensation, dispensation of justice general reason. So when the prophets are declared to be hakam, it means the inferences they draw, the conclusions they draw from the scriptures are always right because they are guided by Allah. <coughs> And their verdict is the last verdict. After that, there is no difference of opinion, but no choice is given to you to differ with him. And other means that they are so just and so absolutely just that whenever they decide, even apart from these, these doctrinal differences, they will decide justly. In every matter of detail, their decision will be the justice. Now, these two qualities you find in the Holy Quran mentioned about Hazrat Rasulullah himself and some other prophets as well. Generally, about prophets uh, and by name about certain particular prophets. For instance, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is described to be Hakam uh, Adat in a sense, particularly. During his second visit, when he is declared to be, um, um, that he would be a sign of approaching great change or great revolution. This is how I translate the word Sa. After that, his qualities are described that when he did come ultimately, he dispensed with justice, he interpreted the scriptures in the correct way and so on and so forth. So if you refer to that passage which I, to which I am referring where he is mentioned to be a sign of the approaching revolution that is saw, there you come across this mention of his being Hakam and other. And strangely enough, these are the two words used with reference to Jesus Christ's second coming by Allah himself, repeatedly so. He would come as Hakamadal, Hakamadal, Hakamadal. It is mentioned so often and with such emphasis that nobody can risk the importance of these two qualities of prophethood, which previously by the Holy Quran had been attributed to the institution of prophethood. And in future too, they have been referred to in connection with the institution of prophethood, that is Jesus Christ peace be upon him. And when Amrita sallallahu mentions both these qualities in relation not only to Messiah but also to Mahdi and declares him also to be a Hakamada, the message is understood that he would be a prophet. It is the institution of prophethood which is uh, which uh, is declared Hakam and other in the Holy Quran and when the future reformer, not all Mujaddidin, none other in fact, not a single Mujaddid, Mujaddid has been referred to by Allah as Hakam and While the differences of opinion would also be found in the great times of course. Why not? Why this total lack? Suddenly, when the Imam Mahdi is mentioned, when Messiah is mentioned to appear, the word Hakamadal is used repeatedly with great emphasis regarding these two institutions. These two institutions in name, of course, but in reality, they would be one and the same person. It would be the one person representing these two institutions, let's say. So, Hakamadal is also a very important attribute or quality of a prophet which is a very special favor and blessing of Allah which is not shared to that degree and to that excellence by any other person. Be he a Siddhi or Shaheed or Saleh. 
So when prophets pass away, you go on missing that special quality of Hakam, which is never fulfilled by any other person. This is why the need of these distinguished production, these students and differences of opinions, and the creation of sects after another sect. Until the Muslim Umbah is divided into 72 sects. You can't conceive of such a situation in the lifetime of a prophet. Because immediately all the, all the differences, differences will be resolved with reference to the guidance a prophet receives from Allah Himself. After that, there is no question left for any differences of opinion. So, this is also a great, great blessing of prophethood. And which uh, uh, people miss and look forward to, <coughs> which cannot be fulfilled by just the book, the scripture itself. Another special blessing of the institution of prophethood, as mentioned in the Holy Quran, is the quality of a prophet or the ability of a prophet to lead people from darkness to light. Of course, the Holy Quran also, and other scriptures as well, previous to the Holy Quran, had that quality about them. And all godly people have that quality. But when you read this about this quality with reference to the prophets, it acquires a very special role and a very special emphasis, which cannot be shared by anyone else other than a prophet. The Holy Quran, in one place, in Surah Al-Maidah, mentions this about Ahlul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the following words. Yahdi Behillahu Manil Taba'a Rizwanahu Subhal As-Salam Wa Yukhidahum Min Al-Zulumat Ila Al-Nur Beiznihi Wa Yahdihi Ila Surat Al-Mustaqim Generally, this verse is translated differently than what I think it should be translated. And I'll give my reason why after reading the general translation, normally accepted. The translation we come across in Morana Sharon Insight's translation is this, thereby does Allah guide those who seek his pleasure on the paths of peace and this leads them out of every kind of darkness into light by his will and guides them to the right path. This is the general uh, style of translation of these verses. And uh, those who understand Arabic, they would understand better what I mean by uh, by saying that this verse can be translated in two ways. One is the way in which this is translated. In this way, the subject of Yahdi, that is the one who guides, is taken to be God Himself. And the translation rendered in this, Yahdi Behillaho Manit Taba Rizwanahu Subhul Salam. Allah guides them. Of course, this is obvious. I mean, Allah is the obvious object, subject. But the word Behi is now the pivotal word, the important word, which can be given different terms. If you translate the word Behi, as Mori Shervisar has translated, Thereby, thereby does Allah guide those. The He is translated as thereby. What thereby means is not explained. It may mean Allah guides them with the, with the instrument of the Holy Quran. But when guidance as such is mentioned, generally the style of the Holy Quran is to mention it to refer to in the feminine gender, Beha, Hadaya as such is referred to in the feminine gender, that is, um, um, 
Yeah, well, I have certain verses in mind, but I leave it unless I remember them correctly. I will not uh, harp on this further. But leaving that alone, the word Behi may mean to refer to the Holy Quran or by a general process, may mean to refer to a general process of guiding people. Morana Shah Misai translated it in this latter sense. He has taken this word to mean Behi to refer to a general process of reform of guidance which Allah generally adopts. But as I have said, it may mean the Holy Quran. But if you read the verse just previous to this, prior to this verse, there it is not the Holy Quran which is mentioned, it is the Holy Prophet of Islam which is mentioned. So the he obviously is referred to the Holy Quran, Holy Prophet of Islam, not to the Holy Book. So this is why I prefer to translate it, translate it in the following words. With the instrument of the Holy Prophet of Islam, making him the cause, Allah guides everything. That is through the Holy Prophet of Islam, Allah guides others. This would be the translation which I, do, I should prefer and I have reasons to believe on the authority of another verse of the Holy Quran which I will quote later on that this is the correct translation and it should be followed. Again when you read by Yukhrejuhum nur the translators tell us that Yukhrejuh refers to Allah that Allah takes people away from darkness to light. It may of course, there is no objection. But then the, fun, then the following expression would create certain problems. There is maybe. Why there is a need of inserting this word there is maybe? With the order of Allah. <laughs> So, this leaves the translators in some difficulty and they somehow manage out of this. You know, Maulvi Shirley Sahib has solved this problem by, you know, in a, in a, in a very comely way, but in a way, of course, he says and leaves them, the meaning Allah leaves them, leaves them out of every kind of darkness into light by his will. This is not so. When prophets are referred to uh, performing some miracle, some great thing, it is the style of the Holy Quran that the word Bezme is added later on. To remind us that prophets cannot do on their own. This is too great a thing for them to achieve. Only because of Allah's will. When it joins their will, then this miracle is performed. So, Bismahi is a telltale word which tells us that Yukhrajuhum is refers to not to Allah but to the Holy, again to the Holy Prophet of Islam. Now, the verse which supports this view is very clear on the subject. I have taken it from Surah Ibrahim. The very first verse tells us Alif Lam Ra. Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka. That is Alif Lam Ra, this is a book which we have revealed to thee, O Prophet of Islam. That is to say. Let Tukhrajan Nasamin as well, Mate Lamin. Let you turn people out of darkness into light. There is no The same day is maybe. The word is explained. With the order of Allah, their creator, their Lord. So this verse clarifies those ambiguous features of the previous word very clearly and definitely. So I am left with no choice but to translate that in the same the light of this verse. 
So this again is a very special quality of Prophet Prophet. Although all those who follow Prophets are also endowed to a degree in this quality, this is your and my and everybody else is tasked to believe in the Prophets of Allah and particularly in the Holy Prophet of Islam to guide people from darkness to light. But initially, and with the greatest success, this is performed, this task is performed by prophets and greatest of all by the Holy Prophet of Islam, Adil Muhammad Mustafa, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he left us, we begin to see and observe gradually the border, the, the, the frontiers of darkness creep upon the frontiers of light slowly but steadily and forth. And gradually the light disappears. This I have already demonstrated to you previously was predicted by Amr Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. So there has to be a difference between the presence of a prophet and the absence of a prophet. And every office of prophethood which is performed later on by lesser people does not create such reserves and does not have that holding power and staying power with the result that gradually and in the beginning imperceivably but later on visibly you begin to lose ground in every direction until a time comes when the entire age cries for the coming of a new prophet. As Iqbal says, ye daur apne brahim ki talash mein sanam kade ki sada la ilahe. A time comes when the entire age cries out to God. Oh God, send a new prophet. And Abraham is required. That's because the people have become idolaters. The whole age has become idolaters. Idol worship is now in the lantern. <coughs> so this happens in every branch of prophet's functions and ultimately creates a collective effect. In every field, you begin to feel the absence of a prophet slowly and gradually with an increasing tempo of course. Ultimately, the entire purpose of the Prophet's coming is nullified in reality. Despite the fact that the book remains, the traditions remain, apparently the picture of Islam remains, but not quite. There is something lacking, some fundamental value is lacking. This is what refer, is referred to by the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, himself, in his prediction. Sayati al nas zamanu la yabka min al islam illa ismuhu wa la yabka min al quran illa rasul. What a tragic prediction to be made by any prophet, particularly by the greatest of all. Who took mankind from the lowest ranks and raised them to the loftiest platform. He was shown so clearly the tragic end of the Muslim people, not end, but a period, the most tragic period through which they would pass in the ultimately in the latter days. And he was made to predict that a time, most unfortunate time is going to come, an age is going to set on mankind, when Islam will be left only in name, not in reality. When the Holy Quran will be left only for the scribes to write, but it will not be written on, 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 on the hearts of people, it will not run into the blood of people. To be just a, a beautiful sky, you know, a scripture and nothing more. So, this is what I mean by taking people away from life 
is a very special feature of prophethood. When the prophets are no longer there, gradually we will begin to travel from light to darkness. And this process is bound to ripen. There is no going away with it. No number of Mujahideen can arrest this process, unfortunately. Had Mujahideen been capable of arresting this process entirely and reversing it, the Holy Prophet of Islam could never have made this prediction. That Sayyati al Nas is Amani, La Yakkam in Islam is Mohu, or La Yakkam in Quran is the Rasmu. Musajidu Hum Amiratu, Wa Yakrabu Min Urda. Apparently, their moths will be full. As you go, visit moths of the other Muslims everywhere in the world, particularly during Ramadan, they are so full. You see, this is Christ. But the Holy Prophet of Islam was told 1400 years ago by Allah Himself that they will be apparently full, but they will be empty of guidance. They would not be light of Allah in your mosque. These are the unfortunate times we are witnessing, we are passing through. If these are not the times, as mentioned in these predictions, if the mullahs would insist that we are still passing through the time of light and the time is darkness is yet to set in, then you can imagine the extent of the darkness. Oh God, save us! The torture of witnessing that darkness, which would be compared dark as compared to the present day. If this is not darkness, what darkness is? I mean, you can't conceive, you can't imagine anything else. And that is a very, very bad omen, very sad omen for the future of Islam, if we believe that. That this prophecy has not yet come to be fulfilled, so we must wait for the worst to come. Is that what they augur for Islam? No, not at all. This prophecy has been fulfilled in detail. And the following prophecies were expected to be filled in the wake of this. And as we see, as Ahmadis, those prophecies have also been fulfilled with the grace of Allah. And a prophet did come to usher us back from darkness to light. And we are we witnessing that light. We are passing through that age of broadening daylight with the passage of time. It is gaining more and more space and ultimately expelling darkness back to its original quarters. Now, having done all this, when a Hakam Adal appears, that is the institutional prophet. That is the, the purpose and function of the prophet. When he resolves the these differences, when he brings the light of Allah back into play, then what happens? The unified society is again carved out of that society which is split into sections and factions. The unity of God is no longer a unity in heaven. It becomes exhibited in the form of one Muslim body, inscrutable body, one whole as such, where Muslim is attached in the most brotherly ties to the other Muslim. Where the whole body of Islam becomes one body, like the body of a single person. This phenomenon is described in the Holy Quran in so many places. The verse I have chosen is this Wa tasimu bi hablillahi jabinum wa la tafarraku waskuru nematallahi alaykum is kuntum adan falla fabena kuru. فَأَصْبَعْتُمْ بِنَيْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانَا وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ شَفَا حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْ قَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا فَذَالِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ آيَاتِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْتَدُونَ 
and hold fast all together by the rope of Allah. What is this rope of Allah? Where has it disappeared? Because the quality as described, we're going to have explained it in English, is the quality which imparts unification, oneness to the society which is attached to the rope of Allah. When that quality is lacking, obviously either the rope of Allah is lacking or we somehow we are blind to it, its existence and its presence. We don't know how to grow for it, where to have it, where to hold it. So, what is this rope of Allah? This is prophethood. The prophethood and the institution of Khilafat which it leaves behind. Only perfect unity can be found at the time of prophethood between in the Ummah, at the time of the, of the prophethood and in the following times of the successors of the prophet. Once both the institution of Khilafat and the institution of prophethood are no longer accessible, then the unity also becomes inaccessible. It disappears and fritters away and splits into pieces and fragments. So the, the verse as translated in the Holy Quran is this, uh, in, in, in the knowledge of uh, uh, Shirley Sahib's rendering meaning to English is this, and hold fast all together by the rope of Allah and be not divided. This is the quality of the rope of Allah. It will prevent divisions. And remember the favor of Allah which He bestowed upon you when you were enemies and He united your hearts in love, so that by His grace you became as brothers and you were on the brink of a pit of fire and He saved you from it. <coughs> Thus does Allah explain to you His commandments, if you may be guided. Now this is one of the greatest blessings of the institution of prophethood, which cannot be replaced by any other institution. It can, this process can only be initiated by a prophet himself and by no other person. Not even by institution of Khilafat, because the Khilafat inherits this unification from a Prophet and just continues to maintain it. That is all the Khilafat does. But in the first place, this blessing is shown to the people through the institution of Prophethood and by no other institution at all. This is the import of this verse which I have just read to you. So once in the world of Islam, we lost Khilafah, the most sacred institution after the Prophet. You see what happened? As long as they were caliphs, the Khilafah the Rashida I mean, not the caliphs who were called caliphs, the so-called caliphs, but who were kings in reality and the emperors and so on. That's the sovereigns of states, nothing more. But I am talking not of them, but of the caliphs which are called Khilafah Khilaf Rashidi, the guided ones of from Allah. When we lost that wonderful institution, from then on, without looking back, people, Muslim, the Muslims went on splitting and dividing against themselves. Seventy-two sects is just a number to denote that multiplication. But in reality, this multiplication is much more profuse and numerous. In each sect, there are further divisions. In each further division, there are further divisions. Until each mullah or mosque differs with the other mullah or the other mosque. <laughs> <coughs> there are hundreds of thousands of divisions. And no I repeat, no Bujadir could ever force that unity again. 
that were lost to the world is. He can't carve this segment out of, of these people and left the matter at that. But as a whole, the world of Islam, once disunified, continued to disunify further and further and further. And the only remedy for this ailment, as mentioned in the Holy Quran, is the institution of Prophet. That is the Nehmar. This is why the, the highest, the loftiest Nehmar described in the Holy Quran is the Prophet. No other Nehmar can compete with it. Now, without having achieved all these qualities, the future of Islam cannot be, could not be vouchsafed, could not be guaranteed. Without re establishing all these lost values, which are established in the first place by prophethood, it is impossible to foresee a glorious, brilliant future for Islam. It would be childish, it would be a fool's dream. With all this state, with all these differences, with all this darkness creeping upon the people and the hearts of the people, with all this uh, misinterpretation of the Holy Quran and differences in the fundamentals and loss in the quality of character and immorality and all that, and corruption, you know, there is an endless list of the melodies which the, uh, most unfortunately uh, Umat and Muslima is witnessing now. Now, can you conceive of a glorious era of victory of Islam with this stuff available? With this state of affairs? See, see. All those lost values had to be regained. The unity had to be forged once again and established before looking for the great revival of the movement of Islam which will ultimately establish Islam's superiority over all other states and make Islam victorious over the rest of the world. These were the prerequisites. I mean, any man with, a, with an atom of sanity can see through it that without uh, establishing the same qualities as were left by Ahmad through the special blessings of that world, no new launching of movement of the worldwide supremacy of Islam can ever be conceived. So this is exactly how the Holy Quran sees it. And when you read in the Holy Quran, the verse, This is mentioned in Tawa as well as in Surah Saf. The commentator of the Holy Quran and the great Muslim scholar and holy man have interpreted this verse to mean the coming of Messiah and the Mahdi. Now before I harp on that subject, let me explain the meaning of this verse to those who do not understand Arabic. The little translation is, He it is, that is Allah, who sent His messenger with guidance and the religious religion of truth that he may make it prevail over every other religion and faith, even though the idolaters may dislike it. Now those holy commentators of the Holy Quran, which appeared at a later date, in, the, in a later age, they knew that this is a promise for the ultimate victory of Islam, but they also read the signs around them and they could not conceive of a possibility of that victory being which attained with the stuff available around them. So they faced this dilemma 
of contradiction between a claim and the reality of things. It is a very tall claim, the tallest ever made by any religion, that Allah has sent this Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, so that his faith becomes calm, uh, uh, victorious over all the rest of the faiths of the world and becomes the ultimate in everything. This is by far the tallest claim ever made by any religious book. So the commentators of the Holy Quran in the later centuries faced this dilemma. This is a very tall claim. Yet in the first manifestation of prophethood, Allah Wasallam, although Islam made inroad into various societies and became victorious in many parts of the world, yet once that movement was arrested, then from then on we witness a process of decay setting. And this prophecy is not yet fulfilled. How could that prophecy would be fulfilled with this material available, which has been eaten away by the moths of decay, which has been corrupted by the passage of time? How could this great miracle be brought about? This was the dilemma faced by these commentators. And the answer they came out invariably was this. Yes, this verse applies the coming of Messiah. This verse applies to the time of coming of Mahdi. How logical and how honest and God-fearing they were. You know, this is the quality of holiness when you, you come across the quality of holiness. You know it. You, 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 you feel it. That there is a pious and honest and truthful person speaking to you. They could not fill the people with a false hope that you are the people who are going to bring about that because the Holy Prophet of Islam has come and it was he who was to bring about that ultimate victory. You are his successor, so you will gradually, inshallah, with the passage of time, you will become victorious. They left the present as they saw it at their time and jumped to the future and attach this glorious future of Islam to, a, to another future of Islam in which the promised Messiah would have appeared and the promised Mahdi would have appeared. And they related this phenomenon to their coming and their uh, uh, appearance on earth. Without that, they could not conceive the final victory of Islam. So that again is the institution of prophethood. This great victory could be brought about by no less a person than Rasul himself. So unless he is a Rasul who is representing Allah in the maximum degree, he could not bring about this miracle. And as I have said, it is correctly understood by the previous commentators that it is a Rasul himself which is mentioned and, and it is the time of the Mahdi and Messiah which is referred to. And we are right passing through that, that age now. Yeah. Only after this, I will change to another subject, so let me finish this one. <laughs> 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 And again, if Tarabat is Sato, one shakal kama. There is a verse of the Holy Quran which I have just recited, revealed in Surah, found in Surah Zukhraf, verse number 62 or 63. 62. But verily, he was a sign of the hour. This is a passage. The sign of the hour. So have no doubt about it, but follow me. This is the right path. The second verse which I have decided is from Surah Al-Qamar, verse number 2. 
which means the hour has gone by and the moon is then ascendant. These two verses should be understood and can only be understood in juxtaposition to each other. Because we are talking about the same thing and the words are can only be understood when we, when we read them together. The first verse, verse which I read related to the coming of Messiah, peace be upon him. <coughs> the second advent of Messiah. And the Holy Quran tells us, Innahu la ilmul nisa. He would be the sign of approaching sa. The word sa is translated here as the ah. This is the literal translation. Sa means the ah. Most of the Muslim scholars have misunderstood this verse by translating this word sa to mean the doomsday. And they think that what was predicted was this that when Messiah would appear during his second advent, the Sa would be so close at his heels that he would hardly have delivered his message when the doomsday would come upon the mankind and they would, the mankind would be dark out of his face of the earth. This is the concept of the coming of the second, second coming of the Messiah. What would have he achieved before that Sa? According to these scholars, he would have killed all the, all the swines. What else could you expect? He would have broken all the material symbols of, of cocks. What else could a prophet achieve? So now the purpose has been fulfilled, the ultimate of Islam has come to pass. So the time has come that mankind should be wiped out from the face of this earth. This is totally wrong, absolutely right off the mark. Because the word sa by the earliest scholars, by the early holy, holy, holy scholars have been interpreted in three different ways. One of them is of course the doomsday according to them, but the other is a great revolution and a spiritual revolution for that matter. Here in this stock context it cannot be translated but in the terms of a spiritual revolution and in no other way. Why? Because, as you read the next verse, which I have just recited, that verse applies to the time of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the word, the same word sa, is used in relation to Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's coming himself, his own coming. And it says, iqtarabat is Again, the same word is used. The sa, that with the Holy Prophet's coming is so close to the Sa that Sa is not very far off. And uh, this has been demonstrated to you by the splitting of moon. The splitting of moon is a sign of the closeness of Sa and this has happened in the time of Allah Sallallahu How many years have passed since? at least 1400 years and where is that Sa? If the Sa means the doomsday, the doomsday should long before have come and wiped us out of this existence and we would not be here sitting in this loss discussing this matter. What does Iktaraba mean? It means it's very close and it seems just about to come. And when this word is used in context with Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nobody can translate it as the sa as a doomsday. Because if he does it, then the, the reality of life would uh, reject this meaning, would contradict this meaning. Because 1400 years is not a time which can be described as ikhtara. And yet we don't see any signs of doomsday at all. So Sa can only mean the great spiritual revolution. And now once you have understood this meaning, a most beautiful world of meaning dawns upon us. Now strangely enough, 
these these words are relating particularly to any single prophet <coughs> only appears about two prophets and none other about Ahadu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first coming and about his second coming in the form of Messiah and Mahdi. So that means Sa means the world revolution. The first manifestation of the spiritual world revolution was witnessed by man by the unfolding of Islam in the time of Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa. <laughs> so Iqtarabat Sa means the great spiritual revolution for, for which the mankind was awaiting for so long. The revolution of the universal religion. The great era of life to which Ahmad Sallallahu Alaihi will usher the mankind. So it was close at hand because Ahmad Sallallahu Alaihi had come and the process was in the process of being revealed. The whole um, message was in the process of being revealed. And the second coming of Messiah was also related to that, uh, that process of world revolution. Because he was to come to complete the process of the world revolution which was started and initiated by Ahmad Sallallahu And we are passing through right by case. So the word Sa means the great global universal, global and universal spiritual revolution in Islam, which was to be effected in two stages. The first stage, the stage when the Holy Quran tells us, that is the time of Ahmad and the second stage when Messiah is referred to as Ilmul Isa, it would be a sign of the approaching great revolution. Thank you.